We live in an interesting age, where the manner by which stories are told and conveyed to the reading public is taking on new and fascinating forms. With advances in digital technology, the printed books that have been the medium of choice for centuries now only represent one of many forms through which readers can enjoy great stories. But to authors, this development poses a question. Will these new formats make it exceedingly easier for us to continue to tinker with our stories long after they have already been released, updating them as new ideas strike us, and in so doing, potentially compromising the integrity of our original vision. And by giving in to this seductive newfound power, will we fall prey to the endless pursuit of perfection, affectionately called George Lucasing. Greetings, good storytellers. I am the artful narrator, and it is my privilege to welcome you to learning the tropes of writing. I invite you to cast your mind back to 1983, where the release of Star Wars Return of the Jedi signaled the conclusion of what we would come to call the Star Wars original trilogy, and with it what should have been the culmination of years of writing and rewriting of storyboards and of editing. But then, in 1997, for the trilogy's 20th anniversary, George Lucas, having been dissatisfied with the technology available at the film's creation, now set about making changes to bring the films into his ideal iterations. Changes which, for some reason, included making our Mr. Solo a little slower on the trigger. Then comes the 2004 DVD release, and with it, still more changes, some of which were made to incorporate elements of the prequel trilogy into the narrative of the original films. In total, the number of changes, edits, and remasters represent a decades-long search for an artist's true vision of his work. This is George Lucasing. And to the casual observer, it might seem like an excessive amount of artistic tinkering. But, in truth, his actions are not actually that singular. All this has happened before, and it will all happen again. But this time it happened in London. For while Mr. Lucas went back to edit his movies in an attempt to fully realize his vision for them, such was also the case for T.H. White and his novel, The Sword and the Stone, which tells the adventures of the young Arthur, soon to be king, and Merlin, the wizard who lives backwards. First published in 1938, the novel was later altered in 1958 to incorporate themes and scenes originally planned for a fifth volume of the Once and Future King series. These changes included adding some adventures, such as one where Arthur is transformed into a wild goose and flies so high that he is unable to perceive national boundaries. However, the inclusion of such philosophical additions also meant the removal of a few of the more light-hearted one-off adventures, such as the wonderfully bizarre and magical battle between Merlin and Madame Mim, a change which, while important to the author, was seen by some as an unfortunate misstep for an otherwise brilliant novel. Although happily, this fantastic encounter was later included in Disney's adaptation of White's novel, and immortalized as the wizard's duel. What, 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 what's up, boy? What's going on? They're having a wizard's duel. What's that mean? Oh, it's a battle of wits. The players change themselves to different things in an attempt to, uh, to destroy one another. 
And just as George Lucas altered some scenes of the original trilogy to better jibe with new content from episodes 1, 2, and 3, a similar scenario played out in a decidedly different trilogy. For, when asked for a sequel to his highly successful book, The Hobbit, J.R.R. Tolkien set about writing what would become The Lord of the Rings. However, in order to tell this story, he realized that certain changes had to be made to The Hobbit, particularly regarding the events of Bilbo's interaction with Gollum and the establishing of certain corrupting abilities, which would change the original version's magic ring into the now infamous Ring of Doom. For, you see, in the original version of The Hobbit, Gollum willingly bet his magic ring on the outcome of the riddle game. And after losing to Bilbo, he and The Hobbit parted amicably. Here's the passage, he whispered. It must squeeze in and sneak down. We doesn't go with it, my precious. No, we doesn't. Gollum. So Bilbo slipped under the arch and said goodbye to the nasty, miserable creature. And very glad he was. While in the version that we have all come to know, events played out in a subtle, yet tellingly different manner. The cry brought Bilbo's heart to his mouth, but still he held on. Now, faint as an echo, but menacing, a voice came behind. So you can see that to have second thoughts about aspects of one's story, even after it is filmed or published, is not a strange thing. And while those among us who have achieved fame are prime examples, I feel that the far more compelling example lies within each of us. Because truthfully, how many times have we gone back to polish the plot points of our masterpieces? As it is only natural that as storytellers, our fertile imaginations will come up with new ideas for existing stories when given time to ruminate on the narrative. And while technology may afford us a second chance to attempt to iron out perceived literary flaws in our novels, or even go back after a few books to try to correct the continuity between stories in a series, it is important to remember that nothing is perfect. No work of art, no narrative, not even our dreams. Everything has flaws, even if they are so subtle that they can only be seen by their creator. Flaws are human, beautiful, and individual as the people that make them, adding invaluable texture and unexpected soul to our art. And this truth should be a gift to dreamers like us, for were we to hold ourselves to the pursuit of absolute perfection, we would quickly go. Nuts. Insane. Bonzo, no longer in possession of one's faculties, three fries short of a happy meal. What? Oh! And yet, because the allure of perfection is so strong, we must hold tight to the idea that every story, every film, every work of art represents a slice of time. What resources we had physically, what skills we possessed creatively, and more importantly, who we were spiritually when we made what we hoped would be our masterpiece. So do not strive to cruelly weed out all flaws from said masterpieces, or seek to reshape them to reflect your current perspective. But rather, understand that there must come a point where we cannot postpone it any longer, and like a parent sending their baby off to school, we have to bundle our novels up 
and put on their little woolen caps and send them out into the great wide world, trusting that the love and care that we have put into shaping them will help them achieve their full potential, making them greater than the sum of their flaws. Thank you very much for watching Good Storytellers. I hope that this video has been informative, or at the very least, a pleasant diversion. Until next time.